Okay, you can prime your Bibles, get ready on uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter is right in front of Hey Jude at the end of the, end of the Bible. We're going to read the first chapter. What I want you to listen for as we get the first chapter of 1 Peter read is see if you can capture the connections with what we've been hearing from these Puritans and these early ministers that came to America, how it ties with the idea of predestination how it ties with the idea that we heard in Ephesians about being um, saved by grace through faith for works that were prepared for us before we were born. And then think in terms of how the book of First Peter, the first chapter, ends and how that connects with the mission of this church. I think you're going to find a unique connection. What, what's happening is First Peter is a letter that most scholars will attribute to Peter. They're not so sure about Second Peter. But First Peter is, is a message to Christians who are not in Jerusalem, not in the Holy Land. They've, they've gone to maybe Syria seems to be a, a, a logical candidate. But the, the bottom line is they're not living in the midst of a bunch of Christians. They're living in the midst of a bunch of What's the opposite of Christians in this context? We have a general generic term. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Romans and Jews. Separate. 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 Well, I heard a bunch that <laughs> might get there. Yeah, Maybe this the, the area is going to get me. Strangers. Yes. We're, we're talking pagans. We're talking yeah. unbelievers. Yeah. We're talking people who have other systems that are generally speaking multi-god. <laughs> so they're plural in the way that they see it, and they're making all different kinds of offerings. This is the beginning of the, the time when Christians are called to kind of contend with the world in a way that they haven't had to quite up to this, this point in time. And the temptation is always, how do you make your peace with that? You know, how, how much, we back, okay. How much can I give how much do I accommodate? How much do I slip? What, what do I accept? You know, Paul's always talking about eating food to idols that, were, that was sacrificed to idols. That's just the tip of the iceberg. These Christians are, are up again all day long with everything they do. So what does that have to do with um, Puritans and the New World? We're about to see. It's going gonna, it's gonna to smack them by the end of their first century in America. And by the end of their first century, they're gonna be in the same position as First Peter is talking about here. They had some, some challenges to be sure as they began, but as they get into now second and third generation, there's gonna be a whole new set of challenges. And that's where we're gonna start. And then we're gonna see what happens in America as America erupts in response. So what I want to try and do today is cover a hundred years <laughs> again. I want to kind of lightly trip over the uh, Revolutionary War. I don't want to do too much with that except call it out. There's, there's some fun stuff to do there, but I just don't think we've got time to do that. And so there's a period before the Revolutionary War, and then there's a period at the beginning of the next century, the 19th century, when we get into the 1800s after the Revolutionary War, that historians call Great Awakenings. Well, we start off with the idea of if you're Puritans and your function, your, your raison d'etre, the reason that you're doing what you're doing is to try and purify the church, and you got it right. Why do you need to be awakened? What, what's gone wrong? So 
So that's the first thing that we'll try and figure out. And then we'll see, okay, how well did they do with that? And what happened all around them? And it's fascinating stuff. And I have to tell you, as a guy who taught social studies and history, American history especially, and government for a dozen years, and as a reasonably good Lutheran who's tried to, you know, pay attention to doctrine and what, what we're about, a churchgoer, you know, for all of these years, and interested in the history of, of the faith, I never knew any of this stuff. You know, I'd heard about it, but I had no clue. So I'm gonna try and be a little bit more disciplined today <laughs> in sticking to the PowerPoint because it's, it's fast and it's got a lot to it. But I, I gave you a bunch of, of uh, spoiler alerts last week of things to come. So I'll give you a spoiler alert to start the day. Expect to be pummeled today. <laughs> Expect to be whacked between the eyes. You know, there's gonna be stuff here that like I'm saying to you, I'd never heard of before, and we're just in the beginning of it. You know, what we'll do is we'll go through both of those today. And then I I told uh, Jay and Bob I would split next week. I'll do one more week because I want to do half and half next week, half new material and half your questions and half trying to put a cap on this first set of sessions. Let's see if we can you know, kind of go back over it and make some sense out of all of this. Does that make sense so far with me? Okay, let's get our readers and go into First Peter and then we'll open with prayer. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Salutation. <clears throat> this is First Peter. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God, the Father, and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. A living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genius's genius Genuineness. Genuineness, thank you, of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace intended for you made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the time and circumstances that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings intended for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in regard to the things that have now been announced to you to those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels look, long to look. Call to holy living. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourself. Set all your hopes on that the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is relieved, revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you holy, be holy yourselves in your conduct, for it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as, fa as Father the one who judges impatiently according to each person's work, impartially as according to each person's work, 
live in fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed for, from the frugal conduct inherent from your ancestors, not with perishable things like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your trust and hope are in God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual affection, love one another deeply from the heart, you have been born anew, not to perish, not of perishable, but of impart perishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flowers of grass. Grass withers and flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That the word is good news that has announced you, that was announced to you. Okay, anything jump out at you that you want to ask about or that strikes you as consistent or inconsistent or difficult? I, I heard uh, des, uh, destined in there a few times. You bet. You don't expect to hear that from Peter. You don't expect to hear it from Luther. It's not stuff we talk about very much, but it's there, isn't it? We saw it in Ephesians 2 when we started our sessions. It said, works that are prepared for you, the faith that is given to you, that you've, that you've gotten, that God had planned, that sounds very much like what the Puritans are saying, doesn't it? But it's not stuff that we're very comfortable with in the Lutheran church. It's, it's something that Luther said, okay, yeah, I, I've struggled with it, I've made my peace with it, I want to talk about something else, <laughs> if you don't mind. You know, Calvin says, no, 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 that's, that's the game right there. We're going to talk about election, we're going to talk about conversion, we're going to talk about regeneration, and that's how you get to be in the church. If you don't do that, you're not a member of the church. You're not there yet. And it's, it's a difference in syllables, emphasis on different syllables, but it has a huge um, action component. When you, when you get fleshed out in the Calvinist world. The Calvinist world is really, in our, in our way of seeing them, and it's still true in America, kind of split into the Presbyterian world. By the way, what's a presbyter? Where does Presbyterian come from? It's presbyters, presbyters that are, those are the ones that are running the church. That's the seniors, that's the elders. So in the Presbyterian world, it's the elected higher-ups in that congregation that are driving it, and the bishops of the area that have some authority over it. In the Congregationalist world, the name almost gives it away. Who's the deciding group there? The whole congregation. Yeah, we're going to be onto ourselves. We're still going to be allied. We're still going to have a very close connection in terms of what we believe. But we're not necessarily going to do it your way. We're not necessarily going to accept what the bishop says or what you know some other <clears throat> external authority is doing. And that's going to come to a head in the colonies right away now today. OK, still with me? Other? Other thoughts? That's a good one. What about the way it ended? I want to pick that up before we go on. What does Peter say is, is the test? What are you supposed to be doing as Christians? You know, there's a guy that a student told me about back when I was teaching a sci-fi guru um, named Robert Heinlein. And Heinlein wrote a book called Stranger in a Strange Land. And that was one of the favorites of the sci-fi readers. That's what a Christian is. He's a stranger in a strange land when Peter is writing to them. 
they're not the majority. There's this, they're this tiny minority and they have to find a way to survive and to live in this environment. Now, when the Puritans come to America, they're no longer fighting the system. They are the system. Mm -hmm. And now they have to, to contend with that. And what happens when the system starts to break down a little bit? What happens when they have second and third generation? That's, that's the setting that we're getting started. Earl? Some? Oh, oh okay. I, so. You moved and that's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop moving. <laughs> okay. Anybody, anybody else want to lodge a, lodge a comment? Well, I, I'm on this predestination thing. Is that, I think we've kind of discussed that in some other groups before. So the idea would be that if you, be, if you become a Christian, you were chosen ahead of time. Yeah. And there are those who would never be chosen and therefore never have an opportunity to be one. That's the really tough one to deal with. The idea that some are never going to be chosen, never going to be part of the elect, never going to be regenerated, never going to be converted. That's called double predestination. And we don't like that in the Lutheran Church. It's there, but we don't like it very much because there's language that says God would have all to be saved. And he wants that opportunity out there. But we also teach, if you can go back and remember your, um, your catechism, the third article, when he talks about the Holy Spirit. He says, I believe that I, I say this all the time because it's so important to us. I cannot, by my, my own, own reason or strength, either, what, believe, believe. or come. come right. so you can't do that. But, the big but, you know when there's a, a conjunction like but, <laughs> something important's gonna follow. But, the Holy Spirit does what? Calls me by the gospel. Enlightens me with his gifts, the scripture. Enlightens me with others speaking to me. Enlightens me with opportunities to hear the word and to serve calls me by his gifts, enlightens me, and sanctifies and keeps me, holds me, grabs a hold of me, doesn't let me go. That's another issue for the, for the Presbyterians and the Calvinists. Can you fall away once you've been converted? This is one where I think Calvin and Luther would, would kind, of, kind of part company. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. This is big stuff. For the Calvinists. This is where they live. This is their favorite, favorite topic. And I told you that story about meeting with the, the Presbyterians when, when we started out. If you're, if you're a believer, if you buy into this uh, as this is where you should start thinking about your faith, and this is how you, how you mind meld, how you make, make sense of it all, then it's a very comforting kind of a thing. But for most of us that look at this in a rational point of view, it's, it's a little tough to get our arms around and say, I'm, I'm happy about this. Now, some people flat out can't accept that, and they rebel totally. They go in opposite directions. My former pastor is one of the ones that goes in the opposite direction, says, I don't buy that. That's not the Jesus that I want. The Jesus that I want takes care of everybody. Everybody's going to heaven. There's a name for that. It's called universalism. I always thought of universalism had to do with Unitarianism. Well, it does. They merge later on. But in the colonial days, the universalists are going to fight and they're going to say, everybody gets saved. God's grace is good enough for everybody. Hitler, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, you name it. They're, they're all covered and they're all... Jesus is going to find a way. Don't know how. That's not up to me. That is, that's up to God. We have a good friend. Um, haven't seen him in a number of years. A retired pastor from Norway. He's a chaplain at Norway's toughest prison. This guy Nils Breitung, you remember the news that went off to that island where there was a bunch of kids camping and shot them all? That's where he went. The first thing he does 
or did, he's retired now, but the first thing that he ever did with any prisoner that he met, give them a hug. Tell them that they're loved. Can you imagine hugging Mills right to him? I couldn't. You know, I can't see that. He could. That was his life. He was very, very much and a, and a Lutheran pastor, paid for by the state. Fascinating life, but awfully hard in my book to do some of that. So, other, other questions, other thoughts before we launch fast? Okay, let's pray. God, I thank you for bringing us together. I thank you for this church, for these people. A wonderful chance to engage with your word. We thank you for being here and for enlightening us, for helping us see how others have tried to tackle their relationship with you. We ask you to be especially present in our awareness today and to lift our thoughts towards you as we go through some very tough, for us Lutherans, some very tough kinds of concepts as people have tried to relate to you. But we ask that all the thoughts of our hearts and the inspirations that we bring to each other and the words of all of our mouths abound to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's see. Here. That's not the one. Well, maybe it is. <laughs> That's not it. start you off with Virginia because I haven't spent much time with them and I just want to make the point that overall there's activity in all of these colonies that has to do with what we're contending with and most of us would have heard the name John Smith at some point for the guy who kind of was historically credited with starting Jamestown. It turns out John Smith is quite a character. He's not like a lot of the, the folks that we're going to see, as kind of more of a checkered past than we might, might like. Um, John Smith is going to claim that when he got captured by the Indians, Pocahontas threw herself on his body to stop them from packing him up. Well, it turns out most historians would say that's probably pretty bogus, but he's a good yarn spinner. That's the way he, that's the way he ran his life. It turns out he went running back to England about the time that they were going to prosecute him for some other of his yarns, I guess. And he conveniently touched off some gunpowder in his pocket to give himself an injury that I guess said he had to be treated in England or some such noise. But we, we think of John Smith because he's the name that we associate with the start, and we associate him with Pocahontas. Now, Pocahontas eventually gets married to a guy by the name of John Rolfe. Historically, I think I probably thought she married John Smith instead of John Rolfe. John Rolfe is the fellow that, for good or for ill, in the Western world, we can credit with tobacco. It had already been discovered in the West Indies, in particular Bermuda and I think Jamaica. I'm not sure about Jamaica, but especially Bermuda. And John Rolfe was down there in the travels that uh, he was making, and he discovered that he could bring some seeds to Virginia and plant them, and they would make as good tobacco uh, as anything that the Brits had, had found, and it was taking off like gangbusters. This pr pretty much saved the colony of, of Virginia tobacco. 
So in 1619, Jamestown and the colony of Virginia brings in slavery. So already at the very beginning of the time that we're looking at these two areas, they're diverging in terms of what their value system is and what their economies are. Virginia and particularly Maryland, but especially Virginia, very fertile land for tobacco. Well, the problem for John Rolfe was his daughter died and then his wife died. So he's all alone, he's feeling sorry for himself, I would imagine, and Pocahontas has been helping out the colonists and somehow they got into a feud with the Indians, probably because they quit paying them for the land that they were taking. And in the process, they grabbed a hold of Pocahontas and tried to trade her as a prisoner exchange. And her father didn't do the deal. So she wound up staying with the, the British colonists for a while. They actually took her to England, and there you see how she looked, you know, as you know, as they showed her off and dressed her up in all, in all her fineness. She took a new name, called herself Rebecca. And now she speaks English, now she's comfortable insofar as she can be, fish out of water, and British society comes back to the colonies, meets John Rolfe, and uh, John Rolfe, who's wifeless, takes a shine to her and says, I think maybe I ought to marry this gal, but he has to ask the governor for permission. I don't understand exactly why, but again, this is an Anglican colony, and this is ruled by the church. The church is connected with the state. The governor is open to at least hearing his argument. So what do you suppose John Rolfe says? I had printed out, but I don't want to take the time to read it because even though it's fun to read, it's kind of old English and kind of hard. So I'll give you the translation. The translation is, I'm not doing it for lust. I'm not doing it just because I need a wife. I'm doing it because... Try figuring it out. Come on, guys. You can get there. The relations with the Indians. That's half. What's the other half? Remember, this is an Anglican colony. Con His job is to... Convert? Yeah. Yeah. It's for the good, and it's for my salvation because I'm called upon to Christianize this. She's a pagan after all. She needs help. So I'm going to convert her. I'll make her, and she does. She does. And then she goes back to England with Rolf and so forth. I think he comes back alone. She winds up dying early in England. And this is a big cause celeb. There's all kinds of fascination with this. The place to go to read this online is in uh, uh, the, the National Park Service stuff on Jamestown. Real fun read. But he writes this extensive long letter, huge long letter, to the governor says, please let me do this because it'll be good for the colony, it'll be good for her, and it'll be good for me. But I'm not doing it just because I need a wife. Understand. It's it's because I have better motives. So that's the story of Virginia as we start. Fast forward back up north to the Pilgrims. What happened to the Pilgrims? Well, the Pilgrims get basically merged in with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So now it's all one group of Puritans. So what happens to them? Well. I mentioned something along these lines to you before, but I want to drill down just for a minute because it's going to come up again and again and it's a shocker to me. I didn't know this. Anyone want to take a guess what this represents? What does it look like it might be? College? College. University. Yeah, very, very good. Well, I think... Now, you want to guess what college it is? I'm going to say... Uh, the big one, what's it? MIT or no, Harvard? No, no, uh, Harvard. 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 Well, that says Cambridge. That's, that would be a good answer. Harvard. That's going to come before too long. 
my understanding is a lot of the colonists, early ones, started the early universities. This is Harvard. Yeah. So yeah, that's my understanding. This is this is a farmer of the Pilgrims. He wills half his land for the for the establishment of not just a college. But again, these are pilgrims, these are pilgrims, these are Puritans, these are people who are lifting up the church as the highest. So this is going to be a place to train priests. Priests. Yes. Not priests. Because they they put that behind. Mm. Ministers. Ministers. Yes. Right idea. Yes. All right. That wasn't enough down the road within 30 years or so. Harvard sounds a little too academic, a little too formal, a little too stylistic, you know not quite as evangelical, not quite as outward going, not quite as emotional. So another one starts to build up. You could guess what this is. Yeah. 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 This is Yale. Partly in response to Harvard reputation being it's lost some of its fervor. This is going to be a back and forth again and again and again. What's the right balance between emotional connection. Remember Gary Wills talking about head and heart? How do you blend those two? It didn't seem like Harvard had enough heart, so we get a new college. And it's Yale. Now, over here, I don't know if you can quite see it, but there's a little river that comes down here and then Lewis is off back toward the ocean. That's the Connecticut River. And right here, Northampton, is the second largest church in the colonies, which means it's the second largest church in America at the time. The largest church is First Church, Boston. Second largest church over here, where the Connecticut River comes down in terms and sort of for, forms a delta and flattens the land out, great farming land, great place to, to settle. Solomon Stoddard is the minister there for 60 years. Not uncommon in those days for, for, for a guy to spend his whole life in one church. He lives up on top of a big hill overlooking the town. It's said that his, his house blocked out the sun on the main, <laughs> the main town. And he was so important to the community that called him the Pope. Now understand, these are Congregationalists. They left behind the Pope. You know, Pope is, you know, we don't want to go there. That's how important this guy is to them. So he's popular. He's got a long established practice. And he's one of those guys who seems to have found the mix at the beginning between smacking them with doctrine, but also keeping a hold of that fervor, keeping that evangelical zeal, keeping that emotional content. So as a result, he holds no less than five revivals during this time. He calls them periods of harvest. And according to one source that I read, he'd gotten 300 conversions. Stop and think of that. In my old church, before I came here, we had a pillar of the community in our church that had declared in 1977, we want 77 new members. She got it. Can you imagine how this church would feel if they got 77 new members in one year? Would that make a difference to... Now think about 300. This guy is a successful guy. <coughs> now it turns out there's a, there's a tradition that builds up, kind of unspoken. Don't know exactly who started it, but the idea came when, once you figure that the minister's got about seven years left before he croaks, <laughs> you bring in a young Turk. So they went to Harvard or Yale, and they, there are not a lot of graduates coming out every year. 
So one of the things they did, it sounds like, they held up signs and said, we have 20 available women in our congregation. <laughs> we have 40 available women in our congregation. This is one of the, one of the recruiting tactics. I don't think that would have worked for me at JPL, but maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe someone knows better than I did exactly how to do this. So they bring in his maternal grandson to be his understudy. This guy's name becomes probably the most famous all-time pastor with a possible exception of Billy Graham in U.S. history. His name is Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards is his maternal grandson. They bring him in two years before Solomon's daughter dies. Solomon's daughter apparently didn't understand the rules that he was supposed to last for. So, so here's this young Turk, he's like 26, 27 years old. He's starting up the second largest church in America. And he starts preaching Calvinism. Cold, hard, and he's not the preacher that his grandpa was. But he's a wordsmith, and he's smart as a whip. And his wife is just as smart as he is. And between the two of them, they really go on a tear. And that church, for another 20 some odd years, goes along being in the center of things. We'll see that some more in a minute. Now, I want to ask you a question and see what you think about this, because it becomes very much a part of the enduring issue. Some people like to talk about the Puritan work ethic. Over time, that's become morphed into the Protestant work ethic. From your experience, from what you know, historians love to debate this. It's one of the two or three great questions of American history, because it shows up more in America than the rest of the world. Are you more likely to be successful in business? Are you more likely to make more money? Are you more likely to have more goods if you're a Protestant than if you're something else? Does this work ethic do something? Well, here's part of the answer. Part of the answer is they were told by uh, their ministers that part of your job, this is Calvinism 101, and it's also uh, all the, the, the fathers that, that connect up with Calvinism. You are supposed to work as unto the Lord. Now, if you work as unto the Lord day in, day out, you're probably going to be what, a bust? Successful. You're probably going to do better than a bunch of your peers, right? Over time, this seems to show up in such a way as they call it the capitalist work ethic, the Protestant work ethic, the Puritan work ethic. It all means the same thing. It all means the idea that if you have this kind of spirit behind you religiously, you will be a good steward of what you're given to work with, and you will be successful by and large in the in the writ large. Do you buy that? There's an element of that in the Jewish tradition, where they usually push their children to go into some sure. professional, whether, whether doctor, lawyer, accountant, teacher, uh, they're pushed to do that. Yep. But that, I think some of that is cultural history, because. Uh, as they got dispersed through the years, they often learned that those are the ones that survived. Mm -hmm. But now this is the culture. You know, we're, we're starting off, this is, there's no other culture. It's all interconnected. Faith, government, civil life, it's all the same. It's all tied up to your, your, your connection from what you, what you understand your church to be. What do you think? Is there some truth to it? I see I, you scratching your stomach. Well, if it's a culture, if you're not into it, you're an outsider. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. prosper. Yeah. You're looked at as, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you, you've got to be part of the, the system. Okay. So that's what 
probably it is, uh, it does work. But if the system is work hard, no breaks. But nobody else is, if you don't work hard, you're excluded from dealing with the rest of the community. Yeah, and your business uh, is gonna fail. You've already drunk the Kool-Aid if you're in this society yeah. anyway, haven't you? So. And there's no alternative. I mean, nobody's going to, uh, if, if you're, you know, if you have an outside business and you're not part of the community, the other people aren't going to yeah. buy from you. They're not going to include you. You're going to be an outsider. Okay. So, so it does well, there's that. work. But I'm looking at something more basic. I'm looking at the rules of life, as it were. I think it's like the dominant culture and high, the white people coming in from Europe have more yeah. technology and they're culturally more advanced than everybody else and they have all this free land that they can go and just take over and they're they're the ones leading the show it's the this seems to hold if if you if you abstract yourself and fly at 30,000 feet this seems to hold some truth not universally it doesn't work quite as well in Scotland for example where Presbyterianism has, has its big start but it seems to work in America so a lot of people have written about that. There's two or three questions that historians love to debate endlessly. This is one of them. In America, our situation is such that New England seemed to grab a hold of this fully. They don't have the plantation system. They don't have slaves, by and large. By and large. If they get a slave, it's like this one minister that I'm going to talk with you about for a second. He's a house slave. He's a butler. He's, he's someone that's serving the, the family. Plantation life doesn't work in the north. Can't grow tobacco, can't grow cotton there. Doesn't work. So what we get is we get the canal system that's going to be the site of the second great awakening. You get industry and you get trade. Remember, as, as the colonies begin, most everybody is within a few miles of the coast. All the big cities as America starts, they're all port cities. They're all cities with the ocean <coughs> at the side. By the time of, of the revolution, the frontier is maybe 100 miles from the ocean. That's it. And it isn't until Thomas Jefferson is president way down the road that we buy Louisiana. So the frontier moves to the Mississippi and it isn't until Lewis and Clark go after Jefferson commissions them that we realize all this other land that we've got. And we don't fully get that until after the Civil War. So by and large, this is an East Coast phenomenon and by and large, New England is where the action is if you're looking at industry and trade and the money centers for America. They're doing really well. Now, ask yourself, what are going to be the consequences for the churches? People get this distracted. is what First Peter is talking about. Don't the people get distracted? Not only distracted, I think you're right, but carry it to the next level. Well, the distracted but people are going to leave. Or not what's going to be the most important thing in your life? Work. Work and money. Business. Business. Money. Materialism. All the good things of life. So what happens to the kids? Do the kids want to prostrate themselves in front of the congregation and say, I've had a conversion moment and I want to trust you to judge whether I'm good enough to be a part of the church? Not so much. What do you think? No. 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 Would you? They rebel, yeah. new ideas, you know, same old thing. Uh, they find other things that are not. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Like, like today. I mean, like every generation, you know, young kids find other things that what the parents. Uh, sure. So this leads to the first big crisis. There's lots of mini crises along the way, and I'll show you how how they kept crisis and constantly in their mind's eye. But this is one that has big implications for the Puritans and religion in America. I had to look this up. Anybody know it? There's two, two definitions. The primary definition is declension of verbs, <laughs> where you split it out and you know all, of, all the different forms of the verb. 
but there's an archaic definition that says decline. You can see the connection, declension, decline, it's the same. It's dying out, it's desiccating, drying up, losing its vigor, losing its fervor, especially the fervor. So, what's the answer? This is fascinating for Congregationalists. Remember, the Congregationalists are saying, we decide here in this congregation what's good for us. So they get all together and they call what's something new, new piece of language enters in. It's called a synod. It's like a convention where you get representatives from all the churches together. Now understand, they're not giving power to the synod, but they're saying, let's talk about this. Okay, now let's see. I'm going to do this kind of like a film strip. Go around, see who can who can read it, whose eyes are good enough to read it, so I don't have to read it all. Go ahead. You want to try it? Can you get it? Yeah. Starting with the synod call. Sure. Synod called in 1683. The Reverend Samuel Torrey of Weymouth lamented, "There have been a vital decay, a decay among the very vitals of religion, by a deep declension yeah. in the life and power of it." that there is already a great death upon religion, little more left than the name to live, that the things which remain are ready to die, and that we are in great danger of dying together with it. How's that feel? Voice of hope, huh? <laughs> no. Depressing. No. It, it sounds like today. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask you that. You beat me to it. Well, now we get to that guy I was going to tell you about, Freely Heisen. Theodore Jacobus Frelinghuysen, he's a Dutch guy, born in Holland, comes to America. He thinks he's going to see what he's seen in Europe. He thinks he's going to see vibrancy with these Puritans. He thinks he's going to find people that are, that are with it, that are t together, that are, that are enjoying their, their scripture, that are committed. Go ahead. If you can. Was, Just say pass if it's no, too hard. I think so. Uh, the Encyclopedia of New Jersey States, loyal to the Heidelberg Catechism, he emphasized pietism, uh -huh. conversion, repentance, strict moral standards, private devotions, excommunication, and church discipline. He was an eloquent preacher who published numerous, numerous sermons, but struggled against indifferentism. Are you ready for this? Indifferentism <laughs> and the formalism. There's a lot to unpack there. But fundamentally, what I want you to focus on for the moment is this idea of church discipline. What do you think that is? Keep in mind, we're integrated here. The church is the government. The church is the voters, the church is the people that are in charge. So if you come a cropper against what the church's teaching is, or if you're sleeping around, or if you're cursing too much, or if you're not doing X, Y, and Z, according, what do they do? Excommunicate. Yeah. They might, hey, Joe, turn around, repent, <laughs> stop it. That's church discipline. What do you think would happen if Pastor... Pastor Jay or, or Pastor Bob were to come and knock on your door and say, you're not going to get to come to this church anymore unless you turn it around. Sock him. <laughs> <laughs> well, are we talking morals here? Is this strictly about morals? Morals is a big deal. <coughs> morals is a big yeah. deal. Did they have any if power? You too much. Did they have courts? Were they able to find the church members? Or was it just excommunication? Or yeah. you're good? I mean, was well, there no... Pretty soon there's going to be enough splinter groups that church discipline isn't going to matter anymore because if you get disciplined in one, yeah, just move you on. move to the next one. <laughs> yeah. Now, my wife's former boss got kicked out of a Lutheran church over by us because she's living with a man that she's not married to. What do you think? I think that's ridiculous. Yeah, Should ridiculous. you not allow that person to come to church? Knock on the door and say, stop it, repent, get married, or else 
But what about people not paying their taxes? You know, all the other stuff we do. It's like, really, that's a big sin. Yeah. Well, this is why not, people don't go to church. But, <laughs> but not, I'm not allowing that. We're, what's the basis of saying that? That you can't live with somebody if you're not married? Right? What, that's right. Is, is that it? Male and female. Male, male and female. female. But not even that, talking about marriage of the same. I understand, same but is that just somebody made up that rule? Or is, is it documented somewhere? I mean, huh? That was a belief. It was immoral. So it was. They're not even pretending to be common law, although that's what the world would say of them. But it's kind of an unwritten rule, then. Kind of. They're just living in. Yeah, they made their own rules. Living in sin. Living in sin. That's right. And can you, as a congregation, allow living in sin? Can you have those people worshiping with you? We shouldn't be judging anyway. Can we have sinners in our congregation? Uh, we all are. Well, we're all here. Wrong case. Yes. <laughs> but they didn't believe that. This is very much still there. This guy is so important, and what he said is had such a high effect that he and his whole family, he's got a bunch of, of sons and relatives that go on to high, uh, high positions. In fact, uh, the uh, the hot link is wrong. It takes takes you to the wrong freedom guys and takes you to one of the governors. Right. See if you can figure out where this where this uh, stained glass window is. You can probably read it if you really stretch right here. Queens College that gets renamed. Anybody? We got any collegiate historians here? This is Rutgers. So a bunch of the big names that you're used to from the colleges back east are going to be springing up in this hundred years and they're all going to be tied to these religious debates that we're talking about. So look at what he's after. Pietism, internal fervor, internal connection, repentance, give it up. Strict moral standards, not for me, not for my wife's friend, private devotions, this is going to come again and again, and it'll be terribly important in the Methodists that we get to next time. So, is preaching aimed to convince people of the need to examine their own personal lives in order to ascertain the validity of their salvation? Are you saved or are you not? This is going to be the question. He attempted to ingrain with the listener a deep conviction of books. Do we like to talk about, how many people do you talk with in a given month about sin? Zero. <laughs> how often does that come up in your conversations today? How many people do you know that even believe in America that they sin? This is an endemic issue in America today. Most people don't want to be forgiven because they don't think they've Anything wrong? Anything wrong? They're not sinners. Right now, church attendance is <coughs> the wrong direction. People don't believe that they need it. Now, go back for a little definition that re reminds us back where we are now in, in the Puritan world. The Puritan world is, you're a sinner. You need to... Repent and convert, and it must, if you do convert, now you are called regenerate. You have regenerated your life. If you've regenerated your life, and the congregation approves, that believes that you're telling the truth, now you can be a member. If you can be a member, what else can you do? This is kind of important for Lutherans. It's kind of going to be one of the first tests that we're going to have to struggle with. If you're a member, you can do the two things that are most important after hearing the word. You can take communion, communion someone said it, and you can be baptized. baptized. Right. But, so you, so you have, I'm oh, sorry, interrupt, so you have to be regenerated before you are baptized? Right. Kind of getting the cart before the horse well, is our, is our that's an interesting question because Luther had to contend with it before he even got out of the gate. The, one of the first um, 
one of the first big challenges was a group called the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists said, you guys say that your, your scripture, sola scriptura, that you're, you're only interested in scripture. Where does it say in scripture, go ye into all the world and baptize all the kids you can find? And it doesn't say that, does it? It says, go into all the world, baptizing them after you've shared the gospel. And so the Anabaptists say, gospel first, baptism second, once you've got enough faith to do this. Now, Pastor Jay wanted to make sure that at some point I mentioned Lutherans <laughs> in all of this. So I'll tell you one story. I'm, I'm, I'm running over. I'm, I'll make it next week, but I'll tell you this little story about Pastor Muhlenberg. Muhlenberg is one of the, he's kind of the leader, the first guy who's a Lutheran who comes into um, the New World. He's coming into Pennsylvania. And he's leading a flock of Lutherans, um, and they're doing fine. And Pennsylvania is kind of a polyglot community. It has people from all different backgrounds because the, the founder of Pennsylvania says, you know, I'm not going to beat you up if you're not a member of my church. You, you, we can all come. Y'all come. And so there's Swedes, there's Dutch, there's all kinds of people coming into Pennsylvania. And Muhlenberg has an ear for language. So Muhlenberg gets this one couple, kind of an interdenominational couple. She's probably the stronger of the two, but as she comes in, she's just been in contact with one of these traveling preachers that I want to tell you about in a second. I just want to do the one with you today before we go. But she's come into contact with one of the Baptists who has convinced her that she needs to be rebaptized because she was baptized as an infant. And her husband says, you can't do that. That would be like me saying, okay, I'm going to divorce you and remarry you again when I feel like it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's not, you make a contract with God, it's done. If you're, if you're baptized in him. So she's, and he's, they're, they're kind of talking at cross purposes. There's a little bit of a language issue. Muhlenberg is really good at kind of arbitrating for folks that have different language and cultural issues. And he's also a good spiritual advisor. And he says, you know what, you two? He says, she doesn't need to be rebaptized. She doesn't need to be put into the cistern. She needs to be in the fountain of God's love. So he uses this kind of water analogy. Not a surprise when they're that close to the water all the time and they're still thinking in terms of the sea. But he says, what you really need, ma'am, is a conversion experience. So I'm going to sit you down together and I'm going to pray over you and I want you to get ready to go through a conversion. You need one of these chances to come to Jesus and let, let God take over, let the Holy Spirit work on you. It's not a function of whether you're baptized in a cistern, but it's are you close to the source of living water? Are you getting, are you getting the Spirit in you? Freeling Heisen influences Gilbert Tennant. Gilbert Tennant is second generation. His father builds a log cabin. This is it today. It was a log college, they called it. And William Tennant, Gilbert's father, says, we got a problem because the ministers that are out there today don't get it. So we have to have our own seminary and we have to teach people to be. They gotta, they gotta get with it. They gotta deliver sermons that will inspire people, that will move them, that will get them going. They have to have this evangelical fervor. And Gilbert Tennant is a fiery preacher himself. And he's part of this opening along with Jonathan Edwards and along with the guy that I'm about to tell you about, and that'll be the last one I'll do today. But I include this hot link here to show you something that is astonishing to me. It just absolutely blows me away that there are these old guys that are 
of the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening have websites. And people are still reading what they said and they're following it and they're they're publishing about it all the time. It's amazing to me to go back. I'll show you just one. So how does the rubber meet the road? The rubber meets the road in baptism, Terry. Announcement of baptism. Well, what happens? You have the grandparents that are still around. They are regenerated, they're converted, they're full members. Kids are not. Kids are baptized. But they didn't see fit for whatever reason to come forward and go through the conversion experience. Now here's granddaughter. What does grandpa want to do? Grandpa wants granddaughter baptized. What do the rules say? Conversion. No. No kids of non-members can be baptized. They're not members. They haven't been converted. They're not regenerated. Well, guess what? As happens here, you look around, you look at most of us are not exactly spring chickens now. We're not, we're not just starting out new families. We want our grandkids to grow up in the church, right? So do they. And there's enough of them to start cranking up the system and saying, we need to get this fixed. So there's multiple challenges to Puritanism and they make a compromise. And they say, okay, as long as one of the parents was baptized, then the granddaughter or the grandson can be baptized. One of the two. If the grandparent, remember, grandson or uh, the son or, or daughter is uh, baptized at least, then we can do it. But they're not going to be members. But along comes, well, I'll have to come back to it. Along comes Solomon Stoddard, who we started with. And Solomon Stoddard says, you know what? It doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if we're going to baptize kids, that we should hold people back from communion. And his idea about communion is, it's a means of grace. It's a chance for the Holy Spirit to work on someone. Now, what does the rule say about non-members having communion? Can't do it. Not going to do it. But in Solomon Stoddard's church, they are. So according to the historians of Puritanism that are themselves reformed, this is slippage. This is declension. This is losing it. Okay, I'm going to fast forward here and come back to the Salem witch trials because I just got to tell you a little bit about George Whitfield before we go. All this stuff is bubbling up and we get the first British invasion. We get the first beetle. <laughs> this guy really is a beetle in terms of his reaction in the U.S. George Whitfield went through the U.S. like a hot knife through butter. He hit Delaware and he went immediately to Philadelphia. He met with Gilbert Tennant. And before long, he is fast club friends with uh, um, Jonathan Edwards. And this guy is a preacher like you never heard. We've never had a guy before or since. This guy beats Billy Graham. And he does it before there's amplifiers and PA systems. He has a collapsible podium that he carries with him so that he can stand up above the crowd. He's got a super big voice that's enabled to project enables him to project and be heard. Ben Franklin measured out in, um, I guess it was Philadelphia, how far 
he could go back and still hear the people. And he said, if I make two square feet for one, pe one person, and then I march back as far as I can hear him, he said, he might have been preaching to as many as 30,000 people by the time he was done that could hear him. But half that many for certain were, were hearing him routinely. The first time he spoke in Philadelphia, the crowds came and trampled five people to death <laughs> trying to get in line to hear him. He you know, even the Beatles didn't kill people. <laughs> but he did. Now, look at him. Oh, oh. What do you see? He's crossed Yes, he is. He had some sort of disease when he was a kid, and this apparently made him cross-eyed. It also gave him his religious experience, apparently. So his, his detractors said, he's cross-eyed, he's stupid. And they made horrible cartoons of him. And his followers said, his eyes make the sign of the cross. <laughs> got one eye on heaven and one eye on earth. But it didn't matter once people listened to him because he moved them. <coughs> and Ben Franklin was a buddy. What George Whitfield did, among other things, was he was a master of PR. He took out ads, he made posters, he had them on all of the poles, all the trees around town before he arrived so that he announced his coming, so everybody was ready for it. He had what today we call a teaser campaign going in. So everybody was hot to come in and, and see him. Everybody would be really excited. Ben Franklin writes in his autobiography that when he went to see Whitfield, he went with a couple of buddies and he told them, he said, don't bring any money. Because if you hear this guy, he's gonna talk you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> And so one of his friends listened to Whitfield and he said, this is pretty good. I think I'll give him all the copper coins I've got. He listened some more and he said, you know, I think I'll give him the silver too. He's, he's really mighty good. After a little while longer, he says, I'm going to give him everything I got. And he talks to his third buddy that went with Franklin and this guy and said, will you loan me something? I want to give him generous <laughs> And the third guy says to him, Ordinarily, I'd give thee everything that you would ask for, but I see thee are not in thy right mind. So I'm not going to go there. So let's see if I can leave you.
Okay. We'll pick it up next week, and we'll see what this gives rise to, who follows him. First British invasion is going to be followed by more to come. See you all then.